Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the second part of her work, The Ethics of Ambiguity, Simone de Beauvoir is going to run through a sequence of different, we could call them existential stances or modes of existence, each of which in a certain way is defective or deficient. It betrays human freedom by using human freedom against itself. And the first one that she examines is sort of like at, at the bottom level. She calls it the subman. We should just expand it to the subhuman because there's nothing particularly gendered about it. And when, when you hear that term, it's natural to immediately associate that with a kind of judgmental attitude towards others that would say that some people are less than human on the basis of one characteristic or another. For example, race. You know, some people have said certain races are subhuman and other races are fully human. <clears throat> and this goes all the way back in the Western tradition to, you know, some views of Greeks and barbarians. She has nothing like that in mind. And so, you know, if that's what you're immediately going to, dispel that right away because anybody, anybody of any group could in fact fall into this category of the subhuman. It has to do with a person's stance. And as a matter of fact, as she points out, the people who are in this respect subhuman become very useful tools of racist violence as well as other types of violence as well. It could be motivated against religions or, you know, uh, it could be motivated against classes. So it could be tied in really with, with any sort of violent project that would stand in the way of human freedom. So let, let's talk about what she means at first. And let's begin at the beginning of the section. She says that if we were try, going to try to establish a, a hierarchy among people, we would put those who are denuded of this living warmth. And then she references the tepidity of which the gospel speaks. And, and what is that? Being lukewarm, right? Uh, those who are spit out of the mouth because they are neither cold nor hot, but merely lukewarm. She would say this is the lowest rung of the ladder. This is, that's why they're the subhuman. They are beneath the other modes of being a human. And she talks about that as those who restrain the original movement of existence. What does that mean? Well, as she's said a little bit earlier, to exist is to make oneself a lack of being. It is to cast oneself into the world. Now, if you're only reading this section, you might say, well, what, what does that mean? To exist not for anything, but to exist for a human being is this. There's two sides to this. It is to be cast into the world. This is a you know standard existentialist way of looking at things. Uh, we are in the world before we choose to be in the world. We are in situations. And the other thing she says, it's to make oneself a lack of being. This Jean-Paul Sartre and Heidegger and others uh, all the way back to, you could say Kierkegaard, have identified as central to human existence, that we are by being what we are not. There's a central, you could call a dislocation within our being that can never be entirely overcome. And that is what allows us to take stances on things. Even to be able to identify something as a lack of being requires that in a certain sense, we lack being within ourselves. And that's the mode of our being. That is what allows us freedom. 
as human beings. So the people who are, are rejecting this, she says, they have eyes and ears, but from their childhood on, they make themselves blind and deaf without love and without desire. And so one of the ways in which she talks about this is as apathy. Apathy is a lack of passion, a lack of affectivity, or it can also be a suppression of it when it's not you know, genuine apathy, uh, sort of coming from somebody's temperament, but it's, it's rather a result perhaps of trauma, or in this case, of, of what the person is doing to themselves. Indifference is another way of talking about it here. And she, she, she goes on and she says, this apathy manifests a fundamental fear. So there is still some sort of affectivity, a fundamental fear in the face of existence. So it's not a total lack of emotion, but you could say that this fear is one that's not allowing itself to be felt as distinct fear. It's also not, a, not manifesting itself as what we typically call existentialist anxiety. It's something a bit different. The other mode of affectivity that she brings up a little bit later for this, this person is boredom. And I think that's particularly telling as well. Boredom or tedium, fear on some, some basic level of existence, ruling out the other emotions, making them um, muted, making them repressed. And a little bit later she says, um, this person discovers around him only an insignificant and dull world. How can this naked world arouse within them any desire to feel, to understand, to live? The less he exists, the less there is reason for him to exist, since these reasons are created only by existing. So she doesn't use the term, but we could talk about this person in contemporary terms as being disengaged. The world that they are presented with is a flattened world, a world that doesn't present itself with the same possibilities and attractiveness. It's all just kind of a humdrum, we could say a gray world, right? Gray on, on gray. And so there's this, this uh, rejection of passion, a rejection of affective involvement, love, or desire. And why is that? Well, it comes from this fear. She says, the subperson rejects this passion, which is his human condition, the laceration and the failure of that drive towards being, which always misses its goal, but which thereby is the very existence which they reject. And she says that, you know, this, this reinforces itself. If you think that you've got a dull world in which nothing really important happens and people are all, you know, just kind of schmucks. Well, then you don't invest yourself in that world in making choices and actions and commitments and you get back what you put in. And so there are many people who do in fact live this way. Now she points out, and this is the case for all of the different um, modes of, of, of being that she's, she's discussing in this, this second part, it's still a use of human freedom. It is still a human comportment. This is not being a robot. Uh, this is acting like a robot. Right? This is reducing oneself to the, the level of the below the human. So this is still, though, a use of human freedom and choice. And there's also a transcendence. She says, if a person were permitted to be a brute fact, they would merge with the trees and pebbles which are not aware they, that they exist. We would consider these opaque lives with indifference. But the subperson invokes contempt. Contempt for, for what? Because they are not making of their humanity what they could be. One recognizes him to be responsible for himself at the moment that one accuses him of not willing himself. And so she goes on and she says another thing that's really important here. Nobody is a datum which has passively suffered. The rejection of existence is still another way of existing. So it, it involves a choice on some level. It, the, the person is responsible for themselves and they are also responsible for their world, a world denuded of meaning, a world in which it doesn't really matter what they do. And, you know, she goes on and she says, there we have the defeat of the subperson. 
he would like to forget himself, to be ignorant of himself, but the nothingness which is at the heart of the person is also the consciousness they have of themselves. This negativity is revealed positively as anguish, desire, appeal, laceration. But as for the genuine return to the positive, the subperson eludes it. They're afraid of engaging themselves in a project as they're afraid of being disengaged and thereby of being in a state of danger before their future in the midst of its possibilities. And so because of this, she says, they, they choose to take refuge in ready-made values, in, in values that are just being supplied from someone else. It could be the culture, it could be a political party or platform, it could be an ideology, it could be a religion, it could be whatever you like. And so they take refuge in these values. They don't do it in the way that the next group, uh, type of person that she's going to talk about, the serious person does so. There's a bit more of a adventitiousness to this. It, it could be anything, right? But it allows them to have cliches that they, they use to express themselves. And this is where we get to another really interesting point. She calls the subperson not a harmless creature. Why? Because they can be drawn into just about anything. And you might say, well, that's, <clears throat> that's kind of weird. I mean, you just said they don't care about anything. They're not involved with, with the world. Well, the, the access to values through the ready-made values allows them to be easily brought under any sort of cause. It could be a good cause, could be a bad cause. If it's a good cause, they're not really going to be endorsing it as a good cause, although they, they may see it as good for themselves. And if it's a bad cause, they are the ones who can be the, the bad cause enactors, you might say. So she goes on and she says, they realize themselves in the world as a blind, uncontrolled force which anyone can get control of. Lynchings in pogroms and all the great bloody movements organized by the fanaticism of serious and passion, movements where there is no risk, those who do the actual dirty work are recruited from among the submen. And she says this is why uh, a person who wills themselves free within a human world fashioned by free people will be so disgusted by sub people. These are the people who do the hanging. These are the people who engage in the harassment. These are the people who make themselves effectively bots on Twitter, repeating things, you know, for their, their particular cause without caring really about what they're, they're engaged in. Uh, they've just found a, a, a purpose, a home, you could say, and they think nothing of what they're doing in terms of other people. And she says that what they're doing is they're opposing inert resistance to projects of other people. So not being willing to accept that other people have freedom and, and being essentially the stop, the you will not go any further or will club you or burn you, or uh, do other things. So she says, no project has meaning in the world disclosed by such an existence. A person is defined as a wild flight. The world about them is bare and incoherent. Nothing ever happens. Nothing merits desire or effort. They make their way across a world deprived of meaning towards a death which merely confirms their long negation of themselves. And, you know, she goes on and talks about boredom at this point. They experience the desert of the world in their boredom. And now, is she going a little bit too far with this? Is by, by talking about the, you might say, affect, uh, causelessness of this, this person, doesn't that deny what she just said about they can be used as essentially a tool? For causes. No, I think what we have to see here is an ideal type and people oscillate between these, these uh, different polarities. The subperson can have a world that is, you know, momentarily cathected with interest, an interest in some sort of simplistic, uh, you know, I'm on the good side, the other people are, are the baddies, you know, and it could be that they're in, they're in favor of order, it could be that they're, you know, doing creative chaos, it could be whatever you want, but they're not really committed to it. They're, they're just doing it to have something to do. Sometimes we say, oh, I did that so I could, I could feel like I was alive again, right? Uh, I think the subman or the subhuman that she's describing, that's, that's a possibility for them. And, and you know, it, it would be driven, though, by this fear, by this refusal 
of existence that she takes to be central for this type. 